Good morning. So we are presumably on the tail end of the shutdown and uh, just hoping to restart church, restart businesses, all kinds of things. But at the same time, there's a lot of fear out there, a lot of questions. And we've been answering some of these questions with our series, Fear Less. And uh, today it may be one of the last messages, but very, very important one. God is my witness. Uh, this was outlined two and a half months ago, and uh, I am just amazed um, that God would have this word for us for such a time as this, this particular week. So uh, here's one of the questions many have asked, is this, is this plague, is this pandemic God's judgment on America? Well, in biblical history, God uses plagues to judge people and, and use it as a form of punishment and use it certainly as a form of um, kind of invitation, hey, you need to come back to me, you know, and, and, and just start worshiping me rather than turning to idols and, uh, and running away so that these things will stop happening to you. Um, and we also know that the end times will include such judgments, but we don't really know for certain, do we? In fact, I would, um, I guess we would have to assume that if this is a judgment, then it's a judgment of the whole world because this virus, this coronavirus is in pretty much every country and, and people are sick and dying and, uh, and then we would also have to, I guess, assume based on the statistics and uh, based on the results that this must be some sort of a judgment of God over the elderly people or over the people with immune immunodeficiencies. It doesn't make any sense, right? Because the, the, the idolaters and the Satan worshippers and the scoundrels and criminals, they are healthy uh, and live happily ever after. And so it's probably kind of a daring assumption to make any conclusive um, remarks about that. But the book of Isaiah, from which we will draw our text today, is definitely about God's judgment. But that's not the only thing. All right? So let me tell you a little bit about Hosea. He was uh, a prophet of God on the tail end of um, the, the prosperous age, the golden age of, of Israel and the northern kingdom. And uh, uh, the book that he wrote, about 14 chapters by the Spirit of God, is not just about judgment, but about warning, God's warning that he issues to his people through this prophet about turning away from evil and turning away from idolatry, which was prevalent. Um, ultimately, the book is about God's love, God's great love for Israel and for Judah and for Ephraim, Ephraim. You know, there was a little part, um, the tribe that lived uh, a little bit north of Jerusalem above Benjamin. And uh, Ephraim is mentioned over 30 times in, in these 14 chapters. And so there was something special that um, God wanted to communicate to those people. And chances are Hosea was affiliated with, with them in some way. It was a prosperous part of the hill country. And of course, with the prosperity, there was also more opportunity for wickedness. And so... Hosea is called by, in like within the theological circles, the deathbed prophet of Israel. He was the last prophet, that's the reason, last prophet before the northern kingdom actually fell to Assyria uh, about 722 BC. And so uh, he witnessed the prosperity uh, in the northern kingdom before the fall. And, of course, you know, he's famous for God essentially assigning him to go and marry a, quote-unquote, wife of whoredom. So he went out and married a prostitute, and God said, look, you're going to marry her, and she's going to run away and, and prostitute herself, herself with other men, and so you need to go and get her, and she will do it again, and you need to go and get her again. And, and God wanted Hosea and God's people through him to know, this is how I feel because my people are doing that to me with all these idols, going out and prostituting their faith with all these mute idols. And, uh, and so there was a pain in God's own heart. And that's why the warning, that's why the call to repentance and return to God. And chapter 6 of Hosea, where we are going to be, the first three verses is definitely one of those strong calls to emphasize the depth of God's love. 
for his people, a love that, that knows no rivals. So let me read the text and then we'll pray. Hosea chapter 6. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down. And he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Father, I praise you for your word. And Lord, this, this may be a heavy message. This may be a tough message because it indeed deals with judgment and tearing up and striking down of God, of his disobedient people, so that there may be healing. You are the God in this healing that, that we want to experience, we so want to experience, but we know that you want to go way beyond this pandemic, this coronavirus, to heal us of our idolatries, of our wickedness, of our sins, of running away from you. And so I just pray, God, that you would give us the ears to listen and we would take this word into our hearts because this is about the healing that we so desperately need on every level. And we just pray for you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't it interesting? Um, third verse talks about God coming like the spring rain. Just a minute ago, there was this downpour that uh, as I was even thinking, praying, preparing, I was thinking maybe God is just affirming me to preach this word to us today. So we said we don't know if this pandemic is like a specific judgment, but what we do know that we are torn up and we are struck down, no doubt about it. I mean, as we look at, at what's going on and as we look at the future, and everything that is happening, there is no doubt that we are struck and torn. So, this is the time to come back to the Lord. This is the time to heed to that call. God wants to heal us, really heal us. And that's why I believe these things are happening. So, there are three levels of healing that God is doing. Maybe, maybe many more, but three levels of healing that I see in this text First one is this, the universal healing by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. You might want to write that down, follow the outline. You can uh, follow it on the app that we have uh, or just write things down because these are important things. Notice verse 1 starts with the call, come, let us return to the Lord. Like you're going that way, I need you to go that way. That's where the Lord is, not just any call. Not just one of many calls, but a specific call. Historically, yes, it's a specific call to uh, Israel in the 8th century B.C., but prophetically, this is a call to us, believers in this great God, a call to all nations to be healed from this deadliest universal disease called sin. And so God provided the gospel. Remember the gospel? Jesus Christ God's Messiah, God's own Son coming into the world to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, to pay the penalty that God righteously demands for sin. Death, separation from God to be eliminated and bridged by, by this ladder of Jesus Christ laying Himself between humanity and, and, and the sinless holy God so that we can come with the imputed righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, be covered head to toe and come before God and live before Him so that we can be healed from this sin, atoned for, positionally be counted as righteous before God. If you have not trusted Jesus Christ with your life, do it right now, do it today, so that you too may be covered by His righteousness. Come before Him, be universally healed, be healed from this sin that causes, causes death, to humanity for eternity. But Jesus Christ has restored us. How do we know that this was God's plan from the beginning? How do we know it's not something else? I mean, this text is awesome. Look at verse 2. After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, 
He will rise us up. I'm so excited about this because it's so specific. This is not referring to some random illness that it's going to be healed in two days, but this is referring to Jesus who spent two days, full days in the grave. And on the third day, the Scripture says, He rose again from the dead. The New Testament has specific references to this passage. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus Himself, after His resurrection, as He's interacting with His disciples, said this concerning the fulfillment of the prophets and the law in Him. He said, the Scripture says, He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and He said to them, Thus it is written that Christ sh should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Remember, at that time, New Testament was just being lived out and is to be written down. And so Dr. Luke only had the Old Testament when he wrote this. So ultimately it was written in the prophets of the Old Testament. Likewise, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul wrote to the church, for I deliver to you as of first importance, like this is really important, guys, that what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried that he was raised up on what? On the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So Hosea, listen to this, Hosea is the only Old Testament passage that has a specific reference to the third day resurrection. It's not too much about the resurrection in the Old Testament period, but this reference is so specific that we know when Jesus said it in Luke chapter 24 and when Paul said it in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and other places, it was this passage in Hosea that he had in mind. And listen, the best part of this prophecy of Hosea is that it includes us. It includes us. Listen again to these words. There is an assurance on the third day he will revive us. He will raise us up that we may live before Him. Does that sound like Christ and the Christian life to you? Of course it is. You see, Paul preached this inclusion in Christ, all right, of us being under the righteousness of Jesus Christ as part of His gospel, as part of our gospel. This is the gospel. This is the good news that we are risen with Jesus Christ together in Him, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that tells us to encourage one another with these words, says, We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as, as others who have no hope. You know, people died and we are in grief. And, and for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. He said to the Romans in chapter 6, For if we have been united with Him like this in His death, we shall certainly, certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like this. For one who has died has been set free from sin, so you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we are in Christ, risen, healed universally, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that is the gospel, that is the good news, that over 700 years ago, God prophesied through Hosea, and God laid out the plan for His universal healing from sin through His Son, Jesus, for all that believe in Him, for all that receive Him. Have you done that? Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? If not, there, is, there will be an opportunity at the end of this message to come before Him and ask Him to be your Lord, your Savior, to be healed. So that's the first part of the healing that God is working on through this pandemic. Second, second healing is this, and it gets a little bit more personal. In fact, let's call it that, personal healing by the power of God. You see, the universal sin affects everybody by, by death because of sin, but the personal effect of sin is different for every person, right? For every person, it brings wounds, it brings, it brings injuries, it brings pain, and it brings pain not only to the offended people, 
but also to the offenders, to each one of us according to the sins that we have committed. Let me give you an example. Say that a man hurt his wife and her face is all red. She's crying and, and she is hurt. And soon enough, the kids come in and they see mom is hurt, so they start hurting. And then, and then the, the mom-in-law and, and father-in-law visit and they see that she's hurting and things are tense and they start hurting. And they're wondering, and th there is this complexity of that effect of the sin just keeps growing and then, then other relatives see it and friends see it and they start hurting for them and the whole body is hurting because the church is involved and they see what's going on and then the co-workers start hurting because they were counting on this guy and, and they go like, man, I, like, can I even ask him what's going on? So then the witness is compromised and, and you see the domino effect, the far reaching effect of the sin. It's not just, I mean, I, I think a man would be a fool to think that a private sin only affects me and the person that I sinned against. It's not, it's not like that at all. The domino effect is strong. It depends on the position of the person in society, the influence we have, all of that. But here is the good news. Here is the good news. We need some good news. And this message is about good news. Christ provides a way of individual healing. And there are five key steps in that. Okay, I'm, not, I'm going to name them real quick and we're going to come back to them. These are the five steps of the good news. Confession, forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration, and then recovery support. Ongoing support, all right, for all that healing. We will talk about that later. But listen, think about the amazing testimony of Paul, the apostle himself, and many other prophets and apostles, all right? So, so Paul's reputation at the point when God began shaping him through Christ was not exactly a great reputation. Remember, he was assisting in the stoning of Stephen when we see him in Acts chapter 7, approving all of, all of this, persecuting Christians, giving them over to death, and then he gets special papers, and eventually you see him in Acts chapter 9, as, as he's blinded by Jesus, he has the encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he can't see anything. And this man named Ananias, a Christian, is sent to him and saying, hey, you go back to this guy's soul and open his eyes by the power of Jesus. And Ananias spells out this reputation. I mean, he's in fear. Many people may be in fear now. Should I really come to Jesus? I'm fear, in fear of this pandemic. What's going to happen? Well, Paul was the pandemic. He was the death threat. For the people in the first century, if you even mention the name of Jesus. And look what Ananias said back to God. Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. In other words, Lord, this guy is a plague. I am dead meat if you send me to him. And you remember what happened? This is why we study the Word of God, right? This is why we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Because the Word affirms through these great testimonies that if God can heal someone like me, right? I have a past. Or if God can heal someone like this soul, this murderous, vicious, proud, pharisaic, religious zealot, and make him into the Apostle Paul and give us half the New Testament Scripture through him, then surely he can heal you and me as well. That's great news as well. So look, here's the problem. Let's just be honest for a moment. Many worship Christ, worship God, but don't really believe Christ for his healing, for his personal healing, for every wound that we really have, right? But Christ is the answer. He is the healer of those wounds. And so people go on self-medicating and self-healing in their own power, in their own flesh, their own wisdom. And let's be honest, they really don't succeed. They're just treating the symptoms because the real sickness is hidden deep beneath all those symptoms and all the things that they are doing that are sinful. And the roots of that may go way back into their childhood and way back into their youth and young life and, and pre-Christ life. And so they just drag in that with them in their fear of being exposed. And so, yeah, so they wind up with greater infection, 
they wind up with reduced use in the kingdom, if any use at all. They wind up being deformed. And uh, let, me, let me put it this way. <laughs> you know, self-healed people are really getting worse. They're not getting better. They just manage better ways of coping. It's kind of like this. So say that, that I lacerate my arm profoundly and I break it. Okay, there is an accident and, and it's like, and, and it's all hanging and out of angle and, and I just go like, wow, that hurts. And so I take a dirty floor rag and I bind it up and I put duct tape over it. You know, duct tape, like, and, and they just, I just go on, try to like use that and work. And then six months later, it's all swollen and it's green and it's disgusting and there is pus coming out of it. And, and, and I go like to the doctor finally. Okay, well, many of my friends are saying, hey, you should go to the doctor, go to the real doctor. It's like, I'm fine. I'm just treating myself. And I go to the doctor, and the doctor it just kind of looks at it and goes like, wow, when did this happen? I was like, well, I would go, a while ago I was self-medicating and coping and, and got, you know, a little addicted to, to pain pills too. And, 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 and why didn't you come to me earlier? Well, and, and, the, and the doctor looks at me and he goes like, what did I do wrong, doctor? He says, well, you see, you, you, you try to heal it yourself. And you try to bind it yourself. I mean, look at it. I did, didn't bind this. I did not. So here's what we're going to do. So first, I'm going to, unfortunately, have to cut the wound open. And it's going to hurt, like, like terribly. And then, like, all that stuff's going to come out. And I'm going to clean it up for you. If you work with me, you know, there's going to be some pain. But then I also have to break it up again. I have to like tear it up, break it up, and then reset it. We're going to go into a reset mode, and then I am going to bind it, not you with your rags uh, and duct tape, but I'm going to bind it the way it should be bound. And then you will be on your way to recovery, and hope you can have some support in that, and there will be healing, and you will regain the full potential for using your arm again. Yeah. So that's how it goes in life. A lot of times. Look at verse 2 again. Would you look at verse 2 again? A pivotal verse. Let us return to the Lord. Why? For He has torn us. Why? That He may heal us. He has struck us down. Why? That He will bind us up. So in case you wonder, like I wonder, if this pandemic has any purpose like that, I believe this is it. God wants us to stop self-medicating and self-healing and really come back to Him that we may be healed for good, not just universally from sin, but from our personal wounds, self-inflicted wounds of sin. I believe God ordained, orchestrated, allowed, <laughs> whatever word you may prefer, this pandemic, to call us to Himself in the same way that a doctor calls a patient to himself. And you may say, Pastor, I've tried so many times, and, and, and now I get this. This is, this is a hard message to listen to, because I see myself all over the place. No, I do too. And I can tell you, friend, this is a very hard message to preach. And I wrestled with God over it, but you know what encourages me? The preachers of the past. Here's a quote from one of them that I resonate with. This is John Newton. Remember John Newton? The author of the most famous and most recorded song, Amazing Grace. Yeah. So he was a preacher in London, in the swamps of London, a broken man as captain of a slave ship that turned kind of a Pauline story again. And he said this as we preach the word and hard word. He said, my grand point in preaching is to break the hard heart and then to heal the broken one so in if it's some small way this message is going to help your healing and my, may god give me grace to have fulfilled my purpose as his preacher you know it is stunning to me how many people will go for years years living in pain deformity dysfunction need for really correction thing, uh, correcting things rightly. 
and, and still blinded to the damage they cause to their family, their friends, their loved ones, to the church, and ultimately, and most of all, to themselves. This is not just about the sins. This is about the dirty bandages that we use, guys. About the dirty bandages that cover up and further infect the real wounds that are deep inside. A lifestyle of hiding. And, and, and so let me just break it down for us to four categories, all right? And if you find yourself in one of them or a few of them, just, just trust God for his healing. We're going to talk about those specific areas of healing just in a minute. But let me just raise some of those like wannabe healing, like these attempts to really, really manage the symptoms. Here's the first one. Substance abuse. You know, America is so hooked on pills and opioids. I mean, we talk about it, you hear about it on TV, but substance abuse, drugs, yeah, pills, alcohol, sex, right? Porn, other things like that, that eventually then cause us to develop addiction. It becomes much harder to be weaned off because suddenly you have a chemical dependency. <laughs> you have all kinds of, <coughs> you know, processes that go on in the body that we have to wean off of physically as well. And... Uh, and then, how about duplicitous lifestyle? Um, people who go on pretending, hiding things, and really treat the symptoms by even the greater management of their, of their duplicitous life, one in church and one outside of the church. Lying, manipulation, you know, and just trying to kind of self-medicate through that, um, really in fear of living in fear of being discovered and somehow compromised socially. Um, how about good works? That's a good one. People that essentially are deceived in compensating for their sins, sins and secret lifestyle by going on and, and serving. Like, I need to serve more. I need to do more for God. But in the quietness of their house, they're really hurting and keep repeating the same sins over and over when nobody is looking. But on the outside, they're known as like, wow, what a sacrificial servant. Like, they spend hours ministering to people and treating others and... And probably give them the right advice. <clears throat> but really, it's just treating their own symptoms. How about, how about um, here is another one. That's the one that I call control out of control. Out of control, control. You know what I mean by that? When people get into like, have you ever met somebody that's like working out four hours a day and just so focusing on controlling their body because the rest of their life is pretty much out of control and they have this obsession I mean, I talked to a counselor friend of mine, say, yeah, yeah, that's a prescription for anorexia. You know, like I choose the food I, I, I use and I exercise total control of what I eat. And if I don't like it, I put my finger in my throat and you get the picture. And, and then I eat again and, and it's called anorexia. I'm in control. I'm in control. And, and, and gets out of control. How about, how about excessive shopping, ladies? I know men can do it too, but uh, I hear that that's one that just like I go and buy things and which leads ultimately to like, oh, with guys, yeah, home projects. Anybody? Like I have this project, I have 20 more in going and then I have to self-medicate through spending hours and hours every moment and free time on my yard and on my home improvement and on all of that and bargaining with God that that's going to heal me. Ultimately leads to credit living, right? Out of control. Like I'm going to buy more stuff. But it's really not the money I've earned. I'm just borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. But again, that is good news. Here is the good news. You ready for some good news? I hope you are. Christ has already provided a way for individual healing. You know, I have a friend that has ministered to me uh, named Judy Dobler. She's a counselor and that was instrumental in my life in, in so many ways. And uh, uh, years back, I learned a lot from her. And, and she used to say, Believers have the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the people of God to rely on. These three resources make the body of Christ competent to handle even the toughest matters that come its way. Paul thought so, anyway. <laughs> Judy Dabler. So let me come back to those five things that the body of Christ is fully sufficient for. Taking on and helping by the wisdom of God, by the Word of God, through the people of God, with every problem, including some of the hard ones that I named. 
Number one, confession. Confession, confession of sin. James chapter 5, verse 16 says that we ought to confess sins to one another and pray for one another that we may be healed. How plain is that? Second one is forgiveness. So when there is a confession, there must be forgiveness because God commands us to live that way. In fact, he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, forgive as Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. How was that? Are we partially forgiven? Are we conditionally forgiven? Are we, so if there is confession, forgive. Thirdly, reconciliation. Write that down. Reconciliation. That starts to get a little bit harder, right? Even though the first two steps are hard as well. Reconciliation, Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24, essentially says that God chooses to be second to, to reconciliation among brothers. It says, hey, if you have a gift that you want to offer on the altar before God, and they remember that your brother has something against you, go and offer, uh, lay the gift down, and then go and first reconcile with your brother. Can you see what God is doing, how important this is to him, that reconciliation, that we would live reconciled not only to him but to one another? Are there any grudges you're holding against someone right now? And then restoration. Restoration is the next step, number four. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, among many. It says, aim for restoration. Why? Look at that scripture for yourself. It says it brings peace. God of peace will be with you if you are restored unto him and unto one another. And finally, if we are to succeed in that, we need support. We need support to recover from our wounds. Because sin can be for forgiven. That's Judy Dabler again. But healing takes time. Right? Recovery support. Galatians 6.2. Bearing one another's burdens. In fact, it says that if we do that, that we fulfill the law of Christ. So those five steps, how do we get there? What is the overarching thing? Well, here is the third point I want to talk uh, about as we close. It is the continuous, perpetual healing. A lifestyle of healing, if you will, right? And that's by the knowledge of God. Perhaps if we were to ask God this question, say someone that struggles with God's sovereignty, God, why did you strike us down? Why did you just, just busted us up with this pandemic? God would probably say, well, do you really know me? Do you really know me that you would blame me? And maybe on the other side, the person that just feels like, yeah, free will, free will, it's all that, you know, I can make all my decisions and, and then go before God and say, why did you allow this? Can't you do anything about it? Just like some universal healing, kill the virus. Why aren't you doing anything, God? Chances are God would give the same answer. Do you really know me? Do you really, really know me? See, the Bible teaches that sin is in our DNA. It's in us. So we have to perpetually deal with it, and there has to be ongoing, ongoing, continuous healing in our lives as we embrace this process. It's a process. Let me give you an example. So sometimes I boast in my grandkids, and so here is a picture of my beautiful three granddaughters. Of course, many of you know we had another baby and not too long ago, and look at the baby. She's sitting up, and she's going like, ah, and that's the moment when the mom like picks up the camera, and, and the big sister behind her is hugging her, and she's like, okay, I'm going to take this picture, and great, and then there is the middle sister, April, and she's like busy opening these Easter eggs, you know, it's Easter time, and, and she's like so, and she's frustrated and like watch the sinful nature okay watch the dna now here is the second picture bam <laughs> you see what i see the response of the child like we didn't teach them that their parents didn't teach them that look at her face how dare you mother to call me to take a picture when i'm doing something i want to do i want to do it i don't care about my sisters like the looking look at the look now in the eyes of the other two children like did that spoil the moment yeah i hope you got a good laugh of it as i did but unfortunately, sin abides till the end of the world, right? But fortunately, Christ became the way, not only for the universal healing, not only for the personal healing, but also for this continuous, perpetual healing, healing as a lifestyle, healthy lifestyle, 
Remember, we are ambassadors for Christ. It's part of our message. You can be healthy. We preach this. God making us an ambassadors of healing through reconciliation with God. Look at the scripture in 2 Corinthians 5. God, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, this is the important part. In Christ, God was reconciling, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. You see what is going on there in that scripture? As we are the ambassadors, we proclaim this perpetual healing. That's part of the good news. It's part of the message. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to be, you don't have to be unhealthy in that spiritual way, even if the physical part is not going that way. You can live reconciled in all things to God. So, how is that done? That is the pivotal question as we close. Here is the answer. It is done through obedience. The choice of obedience to God's Word. That's the way. So, let's name a five of them as we close. So, Christ is the way and obedience to Christ is God's way to destroy spiritual strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10. We take every thought captive. For what reason? To obey Christ. We demolish spiritual strongholds by doing so. Take them captive by obedience to Christ. Secondly, obedience to God's word is the way to attain freedom. From slavery to sin. You don't have to hide anymore. <laughs> you can confess, be reconciled, live on in a healthy way. Romans 6, it says that we commit to the standard of teaching, right, that we have received by obedience. Number three, obedience to God's word is the way to affection, increased affection and increased joy. In fact, that's the word in in uh, 2 Corinthians 7, as Paul talks about Titus, how his affection has increased for the Corinthians when he saw their faithfulness and their drive toward Jesus Christ, and how, how the joy of Paul has increased when he saw all of that happening. Why should we not expect that's going to happen to us if we are obedient to God? Let's have more joy. You're doing well. You're obedient. Let's have more affection. Wow, I just love you so much because you're following Jesus. Fourth, Obedience to God's Word is the way to purification. That makes sense. It's almost synonymous with that main point. All right? Perpetual healing by purification. It's kind of like a diet with food. If I want to be healthy, i got to choose what I eat carefully. couldn't just put anything in my body. The Scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, that we have attained purification by obedience to the truth. How plain is that? And then finally, and this is the big one, guys. Obedience to God's Word is the way to God's love. God's love. Jesus said it in him, Himself in John 14, verse 21 and 23. Listen to these words as we put them on screen. Jesus said, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. And manifest myself to him. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And check this out. And we, that is my father and Jesus, he says, will come to him and make our home with him. That is with the person who is obedient to his word. In the words of Hosea, this is verse 3. You see how close related, related this prophecy is to what Jesus promised himself? He will come to us as the showers. He will come to us as the spring rains that water the earth. God is calling us back to himself, to revival, through obedience to his word, to healing that's not only universal from sin, by atonement, not only personal, from personal sins, but also to proclaim this perpetual healing in his gospel that we may live a healthy lifestyle in the arms of the Father who seeks us, of the Jesus 
that died for us and lives forevermore, even as we live before him, as Hosea said. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word that you've given us. I thank you for this healing that you're doing. Father, let us look at this challenge of the pandemic from the perspective of all these points that we just heard from the word, the universal healing by Christ, the personal healing of our sins and our, and our self-treated symptoms that keep mounting up, and then also the ongoing proclamation of healthy lifestyle in the arms of the Father and Jesus himself. So I pray this for my brothers and sisters. I pray this for anyone that may listen that yet need to come to Christ. And I believe that you are doing your work right now, your healing, cleansing, righteous work right now through this word. Let the healing begin in Jesus' name. Amen. My friend, if you have, if you have prayed this, if you have been struck by this word, if you are in need of healing, I want to urge you in the privacy of your home right now, just kneel before the Lord or just position yourself in some reverent way before him and ask him, either for the salvation or personal healing, following these five steps, starting with confession and ending with finding a community that will support you through it. If you don't have that kind of community, we want to be this community. We're not perfect people. We are sinners. But we choose to obey God and keep perpetually to be healed from everything that may plague us, not just from coronavirus, but everything that the world, the devil, and the flesh of our own sins may throw at us. Praise God for these great options we have in Christ. Won't you come to Him? Won't you come to Him? Amen.